It's 1.58 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's uh, 2.58 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Tuesday, January 8th, 2013. I'm Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopian News. I'm about to talk to Laurel Dewey, who's just written a book called Betty's Little Basement Garden. Welcome to Utopia News. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, you've already written several suspense novels featuring the character Jane Perry and mm -hmm. books about medicinal plants. How do your previous books relate to your latest standalone novel, Betty's Little Basement Garden? I don't... I don't think the Little Basement Garden is anything like the Jane Perry novels. Uh, they really are different. They have um, Jane Perry novels are much more, uh, they're grittier, they're darker. When I wrote Betty's Little Basement Garden, it was like taking a break from all that. It's a much more light, it's much more lighthearted, but it still has a really coherent message that I wanted to get out of cannabis. What was that coherent uh, uh, message you wanted to get out? I wanted to get the message out about medical cannabis, marijuana, and in a way that was not through the owner mentality or done in a joking manner. I wanted to show that this is a, a, vi a viable medical herb, has incredible medical benefits, and the story Betty's Little Basement Garden involves a 58-year-old woman who really is the end of her road. She hasn't never really found out what she wanted to do in her life. She lived for other people. And through things that happen in the story, she's given the opportunity to get into the medical cannabis scene, but uh, as a grower, a caregiver. And the story talks about how her life changes through the people that she meets, how her life changes, but also how her, her mentality changes about many things, not just medical cannabis. How much research did you do into the medical cannabis community in Colorado to uh, uh, prepare to do the book? did a lot. I spent probably well over a year researching it, and that involved talking to lots and lots of patients, talking to doctors, actually visiting grow operations where grow the plant, grow the cannabis plant. I had the opportunity to actually work with the plant, which was phenomenal. I didn't expect that. And I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the people in the industry. It's, it's not all lollipops and roses, as people say. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, infighting like any, any, you know, group would have. But I, I learned that it's not the, the evil monster most people like to believe it is. And, and, uh, so I learned a lot. And I, because I, I, people say the book is real. And I think that's because I, I, a lot of the people I wrote about were in, I met when I was working on the book. So I think the stories that I have in the, in the book, they feel real because while I did change names and change facts about certain people, there is still that aspect of, of uh, the reality of what I'm writing about and it's there because of the people that I met. So there were real patients behind the fictional patients in the uh, book. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I didn't. I, I took a lot of writer's license, and I didn't write about them completely. So that they, even though though they have read the book, the people that I you know based it on, they can still say, well, that's not exactly me, which they wanted. They didn't want me to write exactly about them, nor would I want to. I wanted to be. I want to use my own imagination. Right, and and so you fictionalized or combined some of their uh, histories. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell us more about your protagonist, uh, Betty Craven. Betty Craven is a refined Texas former, she's, she's from Texas, she lives in Colorado now, but she's a refined Texas, a former Texas beauty queen. So she has that uh, Texas mentality that, as I said, the refinement, the ability to really uh, be the hostess with the mostest. But um, her life is not what it seems, and so people are under the impression that she is this perfect person and lives the perfect lifestyle. But underneath all that, a lot of uh, a lot of sadness, and there's a lot of regret. And and I and I deal with that in the book. You know, she, what you see on the cover or what you see on the front of Betty Craven may not be who she really is. And as the onion is peeled away during the story, you start to see who she really is and and what she really is about. What role does cannabis play in her transformation? How, does, how much does the work she has to do on herself prompted 
and facilitated by the use of cannabis? Um, I think that cannabis prompts her. It doesn't uh, direct her so much. The story is not really a book about a woman and cannabis. It's it's really a love story, and and it's a uh, I say I've said many times it's a, it's a love story between a woman, a man, and a plant, and. The cannabis is the central theme and it brings everybody together in the story and, and people react and, and bounce off from that, but it's not necessarily the driving force. Like I said, it's really a, it's, it's really a story about a woman coming of age. Um, how do you approach the uh, question of educating the readers about the details of the medical cannabis scene in Colorado while keeping narrative going at the same time? What, what's your process in doing that? I think you have to make sure you're not too preachy. You have to make sure you're not um, just doing an information dump. A lot of the a lot of the history that had to be that had to be told in this story in Betty's elephant garden had to be done um, with a certain flow and a certain you know. I don't want to be preachy. I don't want to. I don't want to be a teaching person. So it wasn't easy. I had to do a lot of rewrites on those sections, the narrative where I had to give history why cannabis was made illegal. Um, why people choose to do it, um, what is, you know, all that, all the history part of it. Um, it's just, I can think it's just made, mainly you have to get through that part as cleverly as possible and so you can get back to the dialogue and the whole point of the story. Okay. Speaking of uh, love story, uh, talk about uh, Jeff. Jeff. Everybody loves Jeff. Uh, Jeff has the love interest in the story. Jeff, um, Betty, he's the absolute antithesis of anything Betty would ever think that she would need or want, but he's exactly the man that she needs and, and needs to have in her life and probably should have had in her life her entire life. She was married originally to a very hard-boiled colonel, Colonel Raven, and um, it, it was very difficult for her, very difficult for them that they had together. So when she meets Jeff, it's sort of the guy she used to, should have been with, but didn't. But then she found later in life, and but she still fights it because she doesn't think that he's big for her, even though he is. She has a different kind of relationship with Peyton. Tell us about Peyton. Peyton is uh, the kid in the story. He's a twenty-something-old kid who is uh, one who helps her learn about cannabis, gets her, helps her get some plants, basically helps to mentor her. But she's also mentoring him. He is uh, in the story because it, it, I, when I was doing the research, I actually worked with someone who's pretty much like him. In fact, if anybody in the book is based on anyone really like them, this person is based almost, the Peyton character is based completely on him. And um, Peyton is also very much like, reminds Betty of the son that she lost to a drug overdose. And it's hard for her to reconcile that because they look very similar. Okay. Um, uh, nobody in the uh, book seems to smoke any cannabis. All the drug ingestion involves, <laughs> involves edibles. Is that an accurate picture of actual use patterns and how important are edibles in the cannabis milieu? Well, there is one person who does smoke it. There's the, the character at the end of the book uh, that she goes to see. I'm not going to bring it up in case people haven't seen the book, but there is a, a, a small scene where she, does, she doesn't smoke it, but someone else does. I actually did that on purpose, Mark. Um, I did that because people don't realize that there's a lot of other ways to consume cannabis that doesn't involve smoking it. There's vaporizing it, which is literally vaporizing the essential oils. Uh, but a lot of people prefer, a lot of medical patients, I should say, prefer to use edibles because they're longer lasting. They're much deeper acting in the body. And I wanted to show, because of Betty has a chocolate, uh, she makes uh, cannabis chocolates, and what people don't realize is that there's more to cannabis than just the brownie. You know, there's the there's no, there's much more to cannabis than a medical brownie or a, a rice crisp treat. I wanted to bring that and and also show people, like I said, that smoking it is not the only way or the best way to you know, to ingest it or inhale it. Now, I'm taken by the fact that history has overtaken your book, and that Colorado has legalized recreational use of marijuana. Yes. And I'm I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on your book now as as history uh, <laughs> rather than fiction well, I've kind of thought about that too mark I've um, I've realized that how how fast even, even when I was writing the book the, the 
was going on in Colorado, the legalization at that time, the push toward legalization was, was in effect. So I had to be really coherent or, or aware of when I was writing it, and, and I made a point to um, give a little leeway in some part of the narrative that of the story, so the book wouldn't be too dated. Although I did make the book happen during May, between May and September of twenty of twenty ten, because that was a period in Colorado history where the caregiver patient dynamic regarding cannabis were will grow for a, for a certain patient where that was really, really in, 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 in swing. I don't know how the new legalization in Colorado, how that will affect medical cannabis in Colorado, how that will affect the, the caregiver patient dynamic that I write about in Bay. That remains to be seen. Now that's a very interesting sociological question about how, how that's going to evolve. Are the medical marijuana patients just going to become regular Colorado citizens? I don't know. Uh, there's a task force that's being put together right now as we speak, and they have until February to come up with the rules and regulations and how they're going to match the medicinal cannabis part. I think right now, because there's not really going to be any legitimate, legalized, recreational pot shop, so to speak, in Colorado for maybe, you know, it could be January of 2015 before we that so there's going to be this year this 2013 the medical marijuana will still be obviously very important the dispensaries will still be there people who have red cards as they're called will still be able to purchase it so um i don't know how that's going to work out uh that's going to be taking up i'm sure by the task this force okay um i, f I found out about you and your book because of a non-fiction uh, uh, op-ed article you wrote for the huffington post about oh, okay. older people switching to cannabis from alcohol with good results but still being reluctant to talk about their usage publicly because of the remaining stigma associated with cannabis use. Could you share your views on this? I dealt with a lot of people when I was interviewing uh, patients and, and uh, recreational users and just users of, of, of cannabis when I was writing a research study. I ran across a lot of steers and a lot of them open to it, but they were terrified of losing control or losing their mind or the stigmas, and that really prompted me to talk to um, a different a different side of them who had very quietly and not with any fanfare uh, started using cannabis to wean themselves off of alcohol. It wasn't necessarily a huge group, but I thought it was enough that when I for me to write the story for Huffington Post about the fact that there are people out there who are they've decided that alcohol either doesn't work for them any longer or they can't use it any longer because of taking medications or they simply doesn't doesn't work for their digestion or whatever. And a lot of those people have have moved over and and trying cannabis and are really enjoying it. The problem is they can't necessarily. Do with their friends because their friends are drinkers and as, as and they're given this this label of pot smoker and or they, the, well, they they could be pot eaters <laughs> they could be pot eaters exactly and and many of them are pot eaters not necessarily pot smokers but what i think so compelling mark is that there were all these people who were very quietly using the herb to get off of to get off of alcohol and then some of them were also using it to get off pain medications uh, they're used to get off oxycodone, Vicodin, Percocet, and we're finding that using cannabis to do that, the side effects, the withdrawal of getting off these drugs is basically easy. And it's the same thing with alcohol. People who are hardcore drinkers find that when they simply have to quit, they don't, they don't wean off of the alcohol like they do wean off of the drugs, they should wean off the drugs, but they, they can't. Quit alcohol, cold turkey, and use cannabis as a replacement. And they're doing it, and they're finding that it's uh, extremely effective. Um, at, did your article have uh, much of an effect in reducing the stigma among seniors about uh, talking about cannabis use? You know, I don't know. I um, I got a lot of hits on that article. I, I got over 17,000, at least 17,000 hits on it, so I... No, I, I have no clue. I've got a lot of emails. What, I've what, got, do people, what do people say? Is, is the stigma still there, or does, does talking about it reduce it somewhat? Talking about reduces it. You know, it's amazing, Mark, how many people 
truly don't understand that there are options out there. I, I got a lot of emails from seniors. Uh, I got a lot of e- emails from people who are addicted to pain medications. I didn't get a lot of emails from drinkers, from uh, al- uh, people who drink alcohol, but I, did, I got a lot of emails from people who are addicted to uh, a lot of pain medication. And they, you know, they were writing me to say, you know, is this really, is this real or is this a fantasy? Is this, you know, did you, is this possible? Can I really get off these medications that are really causing me a lot of problems with my body and my mind? And, you know, I'm not, I am, I am a writer. I've certainly researched this, this, uh, this subject very well. And I could just offer them the advice that what I witnessed from what I saw when I researched, a lot of people were doing that. So there was, but there's, there, right, there is still a terrible stigma. Uh, one woman wrote me and said that she's secretly using cannabis, but she's not telling her children, who are adults, by the way, because, um, she's, you know, she's concerned about it. And there is that stigma. And, and for many people, it's real. What, and it could ruin. What's the source of the stigma? You know, I think a lot of them just don't want to be looked at as, uh, being a loser, uh, a lot of the, the old stigmas that they even ad- admitted that they used against people who used cannabis. A lot of people feel that, you know, the people who use cannabis uh, will screw their mind or uh, the typical idea is a, is a brain-dead loser. That's what you hear the most about is, well, he's a brain-dead loser if he uses cannabis. And that's simply not true. That is the perception that Hollywood, the media has put across I can tell you the, the the seniors that I dealt with that I talked to were responsible individuals. They had been in there when they worked. Uh, they were uh, lawyers, accountants, doctors, nurses, uh, very responsible people. So these are not people who are just wanting to get stoned and, and forget about life. They just want to get some pain medication and pain mediation, I should say, and it works. Um, have you been uh, approached or uh, working on uh, a movie version of the book? <laughs> no, I haven't. I, I would love that. I think it would make a fantastic film. I think it would be awesome to have the film, the book made into a film because I think it would show people that there's a whole other side to cannabis that they just don't know about. We could see, though, how, how Hollywood might want to spin it. You know, who knows? Well, how would you, ca- how would you cast Jeff and uh, uh, would Meryl Streep work for... Uh, for Betty? I would never turn Meryl Streep down to play Betty. I would love that. That would be awesome. Um, you know who would be a really wonderful Jeff, ironically, is uh, Jeff uh, Bridges. Yes, exactly right. That's exactly who uh, Jeff, that's exactly who I saw playing it while I was reading it. Yes, that is, I think Jeff Bridges and Meryl Streep would be an incredible combo. So if anyone's watching this from Hollywood... <laughs> Check out the book. Well, that's part of the purpose of appearing on Utopia News is because it's watched by people who might be able to talk about uh, making it into a film. So, Wonderful. Um, uh, talk a little bit more about the characters in the book, uh, uh, Betty's so-called friends. What role do they play in the story? Betty has, uh, what I did with her friends in the story is I wanted to create a real true dynamic of the kind of people that Betty Craven would be surrounded by and use them as a, you know each 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 one of her friends in the book really represents a certain dynamic of people who are against cannabis of course since you've read the book you know that there's a twist in that whole story how one of her friends had there's a twist regarding one of her friends and that twist is very real. Uh, I don't obviously I don't want to bring it up because it's it's a twist at the end of the story, at the end of the book. But um, the the dynamics that I created with her friends uh, being against it and why and why she feels that she can't be honest is it is all there for a purpose. You know, I brought in the fact that she has one friend who is a an alcoholic, but who is ethically against cannabis. And there's that ridiculous sort of contradiction, you know, that, um, well, just the hypocrisy, really, you know, of someone who says it's okay to get blasted drunk, but God help you if you take a hit of, uh, you know, marijuana or cannabis or if you eat an edible. So I wanted to bring in that dynamic through her friends. Okay, and, and you did do that. Uh, how long did writing the book take? Oh, gosh, the book took, uh, gosh, 
I won't say, I won't include the research time because that was really quite uh, lengthy. I would say, all told, the book took me approximately eight, nine months to write. It really wrote itself many times, as I would say to my husband and many times as I was writing the book, we'd see something on the news and I'd say, gosh, I just wrote about that in the book. So it almost feels like the book is writing itself. Well, what do you want the reader to take away from the book? I want the reader to, uh, it depends who the reader is, actually. If the reader is somebody who is brave enough to read the book, believe it, believe it or not, Mark, there's a lot of people who have written me to say they want to read this book, but they're actually scared to have it on their Kindles because they don't want their kids or their friends or their family seeing it on their Kindles, and I don't understand that, to be honest well, with you. Well, if they can watch Fifty Shades of Grey, they can read your book. That's exactly what I thought. I, I don't understand the stigma about that. But what I would like people to take away from the book, Mark, is really to stop the hysteria. There's so much unnecessary hysteria brought on by propaganda that is not necessary. Um, you know, I think the most that people realize who, for example, this is one thing I ran into when I talked to different people. There's people who have um, never done cannabis, and they have a lot of ideas about cannabis. They think, oh, okay, you're going to take it, and you're going to lose your mind. You're going to be unable to function and all that. And then they try it. They get brave, and they try it. And they don't lose their mind. They don't stumble. In fact, they like it. And they say to themselves, wait a second, where's all this, where's all the, what happened? You know, I thought I was supposed to lose my mind. So I, I think with the book, I would like very much that people would read this book. And they would say, okay, I'm going to investigate this more. I'm going to look into cannabis more. And I'm going to see if what I've taught is completely wrong. And I actually had a reader who wrote me. Who admitted to this? She's because of your book, I stopped my believing the propaganda, and I did my own due diligence. I read further, I researched more, and thank you for that. And that is really what I would love. I would love for all these people who were against it to read the book and realize that they've been lied to. Now, in fact, a, a big majority of Americans now approves of medical marijuana, and a small majority seems to favor legalization. What further role in, in changing public attitudes do you see for your book, capturing as it does a fleeting moment in the evolution of cannabis policy? Gosh, that's a long que uh, that's a question. Um, I guess it's the same answer, really. You know, I think that if my book could, uh, one reviewer was very kind and said this book should be read, should be mandatory reading for every high school student and everyone who believes that cannabis should be remain illegal. So, so you're think, suggesting it might be a required reading on the curriculum? This reviewer did say that. Right. I would love it. I mean, whether it's required, that's obviously up to a, a school or a classroom or whatever to do. I would like people to be, I think, just get brave. And not that you have to be brave to, to, to read a book. You shouldn't be have brave to read a book. But I think you have to be brave to get out of your mindset. You know, Mark, I didn't believe in cannabis. I didn't I, I, I say I believed the propaganda up until about three years ago. And I was just like some of Betty's friends in that book. In fact, a lot of the things that Betty's friends say are things I used to say to people who claim that they thought cannabis was safe and okay. So uh, it took, uh, my, my uh, experience is, has had to do with because of, of cannabis becoming uh, medically available in, in Colorado. I really looked around and I thought, you know, I better research this because I don't want to sound too ignorant when I, I say, when I speak against it. And the more I researched, the more I realized that every single thing I've been taught in school by my parents who were just trying to be helpful was wrong. So, but it, it, it takes a certain type of person to do that. It, so you have to have the right mindset, Mark. You can't just, you can't remain uh, in your little ball of ignorance. You have to be willing to go out there and look outside your comfortable, I, you know, place of just, I, I, I believe something, but why do you believe it? Why? I had to ask myself that question. Why do I believe this? Is it because somebody told this to me? Well, okay, if they just told it to me, maybe I need to research the scientific side. And that's what I hope more people would do. All right. Um, on the literary side, Jane 
Perry is a recurring character in your work. Will there be more Betty Craven? Uh, will there be more of Betty Craven in books to come? I don't know that. Um, I my uh, right now I'm taking some time off to just. I wrote I had two book releases uh, in 2012, so I'm taking some time off. Whether Betty uh, has a sequel is really up to the public. It's really up to. Uh, how well it does and, and how people embrace it. I would, uh, I'd love to write a second Betty Craven book or a little, another Betty book. Uh, I don't think Robert's meant it. I'd like to take a little time and reflect and, and then perhaps if I did, I, I, I would bring it up to date more and show but, what's happening. But obviously oh. with the transition from medical to recreational, uh, paradigm, there's going to be a big historical switch. There will be, and I think it's important that if I was to write another Betty book, I think it's important to back a little bit, allow whatever is going to happen in Colorado to happen regarding the legalization, see how that plays out, and then perhaps if I were to write another one, it would be against that backdrop, because that would make more sense. Right, you want to have a, a, a starkly different uh, environment. I didn't have to be much more current. As I said, I placed this one in purposely in 2010 because that's when a lot of the Colorado was well, uh, working. Do you think you can keep up with history if, if it's going to be constantly evolving? When I was working, writing the book, it was constantly evolving. I had to change uh, three different parts of the book when I was writing it because it was already sort of dated to, to put that what I was going to put in the book. So it's going to be a tough one, but uh, that's... I say I want to sit back a little bit and uh, just see how it does and then see what happens in Colorado. What did you enjoy most about writing the book? I enjoyed the fact that it was a break from writing the Jane Perry books that are, like I said, are very dark, very gritty, uh, very um, very hardcore in the sense of, of the storylines that I go into. Betty was a breath of fresh air. Uh, she was fun to write. The book was fun to write. I enjoyed it. I, as I said, I've said this already twice. I think the book wrote itself. It really did write itself. It was just a fun book to write, and I really hope that 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 hilarity and the fun and, and the sensitivity that went into it too. I hope that transposes itself and and people see that because I really had a blast writing it. How does the role of cannabis as a medicinal plant relate to that of all the other plants you've written about in that context? That's a good question. Um, I've written about a lot of plants. I wrote a book called Plant Power, and that covered 30 plants. And then I wrote a book called The Humorous Herbalist, and that covered, I think, 20-some plants. I can't remember. I wrote it so long ago. Um, cannabis is different. Cannabis uh, is a plant that I can I can guarantee you, after working with it and, and studying and, and, and reading all the scientific data behind it, I can honestly say that there's not really other medicinal herb that I've encountered that has the broad range that of what cannabis can do. I grow St. John's wort in my yard. I grow comfrey. I grow uh, motherwort. Um, I grow tons and tons of herbs in my yard, but they have a very single or, tar or targeted use. Whereas cannabis can be used in so many ways, you know, for for pain uh, management, for anxiety, for uh, insomnia. So it, it's so multiply useful. Plus the industrial uses of the hemp plant. You know, I didn't even go to get into that, but the, just the industrial uses of the hemp plant are, are incredible. Uh, so I don't really know another plant, and I've thought about that, too. I've thought about that question before, and I really haven't come up with another plant that has a varied use of cannabis does. Okay. Uh, uh, finally, uh, just talk about what your feelings are about uh, uh, Betty and her adventure. My final thoughts? Yes. My final thought about Betty. Um, I love Betty Craven. I love that character, and I, I really hope that people will read the book, Betty's Little Basement Garden, and I hope that people embrace Betty and her spirit and acknowledge what she went through to get what she has to go through in the story to get to the point where she's ready to accept cannabis and what she goes through as far as, you know, the pitfalls that she has. And I, I, I think I just hope that people read the book and understand that I didn't have an agenda when I wrote it. I wrote it from my heart. And I wrote it because it was a story that I really wanted to tell that no one else has told. And that the people in the book, they exist, they're real, they, 
they function, you know, as they do in the story. And I think that people will really embrace it because they think they may even see themselves in the book. They may see their friends in the book. I, I hear that a lot from readers who write me. So that's my thoughts. That's what I think that people will get from it. And I hope that they, if they are against cannabis and they read this book, the greatest thing that anyone could say to me, the greatest comment that anyone could pay me, is that they read Betty's Little Basement Garden, and before they read it, they were totally against cannabis, and they read it, and they were at least open at the end of it to researching it for themselves more and learning. And if someone were to say that to me, honestly, that would make my day. All right, well, you've made my day by talking to us today on Utopia News, so I want to thank you for writing the book and for talking to us about it today on Utopia News. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Bye.